We've seen all across the country this week from the NBA to the WNBA and even the MLB and other professional sports organizations, athletes have been speaking up about racial injustice in this country. The 2020 high school football season got kicked off tonight with plenty of new rules and protocols to help protect these athletes. Class 7A Region 1 features three of the top 10 teams in the state with Fairhope, Daphne and Theodore. Tonight, all three of those teams are in action over in Baldwin County. We've seen multiple people try to get out in the water here and, and test the water, as you like to say. You know, not going too far out, probably ankle to knee high depth. We're out here at Jag Day, and as you can see, fans are pretty excited, but I think it's the players that might be more excited. Friday nights under the lights will look a whole lot different on football fields this year, but what about up in the stands? Well, high school bands across Baldwin County are preparing to make it sound just the same. Here at the foot of I-10 and Baldwin Beach Express, there is no straight shot to I-65, but come November, that could all change. As high school sports return to competition around the area, schools in Mobile and Baldwin counties are turning to medical professionals to help keep your children safe on and off the field. Welcome into the Friday night blitz. The weather is getting colder, which means we're getting closer to playoff action tonight. We have key battles all over the area. Rough terrain, wet conditions and on and off rain throughout the day has severely limited investigators from getting to the crash site. Baymanette all the way down to Gulf Shores and everywhere in between in this county. Today's announcement from the governor will have long term effects on the entire county. Well, right now here at the foot of I-10 and Baldwin Beach Express, there is no straight shot to I-65. But come November, that could all change. Standing in the way of connecting I-10 with I-65 are 25 miles of timber. Five years after failing to get approval to plow a path to I-65, legislators believe they have cleaned up the language of an amendment which they hope will make it more acceptable for voters to approve a tolled road. The toll option was wide open in the county and, and voters didn't like that and I certainly can understand that. Politicians, law enforcement and business leaders are behind the new push to get the road built. They say it simply makes sense. I urge you to support passage of Amendment 2. It's a win-win for the state of Alabama. What could be another win for Baldwin County is that the entire portion of the new road won't be told that the told portion would would likely be from 31 uh, to to uh, to this portion here at the northern terminus of the Baldwin Beach Express it would allow some free flow to, of traffic around the mega site if you will on the heels of Hurricane Sally the push to evacuate people during tropical weather is a big part of the new cell we do see evacuations when we have larger storms and we need this new evacuation route as an alternative because in some storms a lot of people do evacuate to the north and to the east. So if there are evacuations, tolls can be temporarily suspended by the county commission. Building this road leaves the decision to pay a toll or to continue to take Highway 59 to I-65 solely up to the drivers. If there was an emergency and I had to use it, I would take it. But ordinarily, no, it wouldn't be worth it to me. I would support it. I might not use it and pay the tolls. I'd probably use other roads, but it would in my opinion, it would get the uh, tourists and out-of-staters, uh, we'd get some of their money and they could help pay for some of our in infrastructure here. As of right now, Baldwin County has spent almost $12 million on the project from interchange permits to wetland mitigation. As for the rest of the funding of the project, that'll be up to the voters come November 3rd. The 2020 high school football season got kicked off tonight with plenty of new rules and protocols to help protect these athletes. But there's still plenty of risks being taken out on the football field. High school football is giving players the chance to return to a little bit of normalcy during the coronavirus era. As the games get started this weekend, preventing the spread of the virus is the number one priority. So before the pads go on, temperatures have to be taken and any possible symptoms monitored. From all summer long with us recording temperatures and monitoring the kids constantly, to, to make sure that they're healthy when they report to us every single morning. Social distancing is hard to do when playing contact sports, and so is wearing a mask. Those are the two biggest things the CDC says we can do to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The more contact you come into with uh, an, an opposing player, and as, you know, if you're face mask to face mask and you're swapping spit, um, you know, that is a big, big, 
source of potential transmission. So while following protocols and monitoring the pandemic has given teams across the state the chance to play this fall, there are still plenty of risks that the players are taking. We also don't know what's going to happen when we have a 300 pound lineman with potentially other underlying conditions such as an enlarged heart being infected with COVID-19. So as the pads pop and the helmets clash, players on both teams put themselves at risk to injury during every play. Athletic trainers are on the sidelines for quick response, but during a pandemic, sideline medical care has spiked. Friday nights under the lights will look a whole lot different on football fields this year, but what about up in the stands? Well, high school bands across Baldwin County are preparing to make it sound just the same. Five, six, seven, eight. From marching to playing an instrument. I absolutely love everything that band is and everything it stands for. To traveling to rival stadiums. In the stands, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we're just having a good time. Some things will change this fall, starting with no travel for Baldwin County High School bands to away games. Away games and bus rides are one of the best parts of band, so that's probably one of the most disappointing things to lose. Away games are definitely, they're a lot of fun, uh, but we'll do our best with home games and just make sure that we're keeping the morale up. The usual 12 hour practice days over the summer have been cut in half to keep kids distance and limit interaction every member has their temperature taken before practice. We've staggered the entrances so different sections come in at different times just to just to keep them social distance and we can actually do our, our screening process that we were um, instructed to do. If I have to sacrifice and wear a mask just to be able to have a band program I'd rather have band like if you're gonna make me wear three masks I'd rather that than lose this. It's it's not fun but it's something we have to do and if it means we get to be out here on the field and be out there in the football stadium then it's what we're gonna do. Rough terrain, wet conditions, conditions and on and off rain throughout the day has severely limited investigators from getting to the crash site. Everything bad condition that exists, that's what we had last night. Rain, mud and tough terrain hampered recovery efforts last night and again today. We do know that the small plane, a Beechcraft Bonanza that can hold up to five people, took off from Jack Edwards Airport in Gulf Shores about 645 last night and was scheduled to fly to Muscle Shoals. It was last seen on radar around 7.01 p.m. flying through a strong storm that moved through our area. Go quite a few miles up to the wood and down all these dirt roads and to get there back to the uh, crash site. A Coast Guard helicopter spotted the burning plane and landed near first responders to guide them to the crash site and he landed in behind that and it just amazed me that it must have been the most experienced pilot there ever was because that was a tight LZ. It took first responders and investigators several hours on 4x4s and ATVs to reach the scene. When investigators got there, they found two people dead. One victim, 65-year-old Timothy Ray Rhodes of Florence, Alabama, was the owner of a company that managed rental properties in North Alabama. Published reports identify the second victim as Rhodes' wife, Doris. Both bodies were taken from the crash site around 1 a.m. The county coroner will conduct an autopsy tomorrow to confirm the identity of the second body using dental records. In a statement released this afternoon, the FAA says the NTSB will be taking the lead in this investigation. Miguel Tulin hosting Robertsdale for a 6A matchup. This is head coach Ernest Hill looking on. He was pleased with his defense. The Yellow Jacket defense was just all over the place tonight. Here's a nice sack here on Bears quarterback Grant Driver. Daphne head coach Kenny King, he was just itching to get on the field tonight. The Trojans, though, they didn't need him out there at all. Baker and Fairhope getting together in the lone 7A game of the night. But it's a big one between these two schools with playoff positioning on the line. This is going to be Hornet quarterback Landon Larrys finds Tyler Jones up the seam. And the big man, look at him rumble. Wolves deep in their own territory. The Lions aren't just playing lights out. Stay with me here. One by one, the lights went out at Lad People Stadium. Look at this complete darkness in the stadium. Don't adjust your set. The game was delayed for almost 20 minutes. The first time in four years the battle for the belt was not won by the road team as the Jags were defeated by the Troy Trojans tonight 37 to 13 here in Troy, Alabama. A monumental game as Coach Cottrell put it. The Leopards just fall on the wrong end of it in the Class 3A state title game. Football on the plains as Auburn's famed Eagle flies in before the game to kick things off. Mobile Christian taking the field in their first state title game since 2016. 
Leopards up 3-0 in the first and look to add to it. Kaysen Linky finds Nicholas Ellis on the screen pass, and he's gone. No one touches him. 85 yards for the 10-0 lead. Fast forward to the fourth quarter now. Leopards now down 20-17 after a furious comeback from Piedmont. Linke finds Toller Kegley on a third down conversion, and he takes it down to the one-yard line. On fourth down, Deontay Lawson rumbles in. Leopards lead 24-20 with just under four minutes to go in the fourth. Big play, fourth down, Piedmont's Elijah Johnson rumbles for a first down to keep the drive alive. Two plays later, 35 seconds to go, freshman quarterback Aaron Hayes finds Jakari Foster behind the defense with a go-ahead touchdown, 26-24 after a failed two-point conversion. Leopard's final chance now, Linke chased out of the pocket, throws it up, and it's picked off by Jackson Hayes on defense. The Leopards come up just short in the state title game. Battle for the Velt travel to Troy, Alabama for a midweek tilt. After a Troy field goal early, the Jags march down the field. Sweet play here to Kawan Baker as he gets the ball all the way down to the one yard line. The Troy defense stood tall though as Cephas Johnson gets stopped in the backfield by a host of Trojans. The Jags would settle for a short field goal to tie it up three to three early on. The Trojans would drive down the field and end the drive with a touchdown pass. As you can see right here, Caleb Barker finds Kalen Geiger in the end zone to make it 10 to three Trojans. Trojans with the ball again now, but this time Barker fumbles and the Jags jump on it. And now they have great field position. The Jags waste little time. Sweet play again to Kawan Baker. And this time he leaps into the end zone. Jags tie the game 10 to 10. The teams would trade two more field goals to make it 16 to 10 at halftime. Second half, the Trojans would extend their lead with another touchdown pass here to Kalen Geiger from Caleb Barker. The Jags defense though, making plays as Travis Reed gets the big interception here, but the Jags can't take advantage of the great field position. Jags head coach Steve Candle talked about the missed opportunities for the Jag offense.